Welcome to the Qualitox Podcast. I'm Ian Kugler, your host, and my guest today is Dr. Jan Leifman. Jan is a medical doctor and a passionate researcher. What drives him to develop new treatments is his exceptional childhood as a Chernobyl survivor. We'll talk with him about his latest research as the head of the Task Force for COVID-19 Novel Treatment Development and about where drug research and treatment is headed in general. As part of it, we'll talk about AI, personalized medicine, and regulations. So let's get to it. Jan Leifman, uh, Dr. Jan Leifman, welcome to the uh, show. You're looking at the USA and it's uh, amazing to have you on the show. How are you doing? Doing well. Thank you so very much for having me. Truly appreciate the opportunity. You are a medical doctor and you're also a researcher. And uh, today we want to talk to you about your point of view about where the research and the, where is the pharmaceutical industry is uh, headed. So what, what uh, um, brought you to become a doctor and to be a researcher? So where the patient comes from? I am a Chernobyl survivor. I'm one of the few survivors of the after effects of Chernobyl from the largest hospital in the Soviet Union. And so growing up in this area, radiation was everywhere. Although I was asymptomatic initially, I began to experience symptoms by the age of two. And they included things like diffuse lymphadenopathy, weeping wounds, and cysts all over my body. I would go from clinic to clinic, from hospital to hospital, with no one being able to diagnose me or much less treat me. In the largest and most advanced hospital in the Soviet Union, I was this interesting patient with doctors coming from all over the country to examine me, but none could diagnose nor offer me any relief. Eventually, I was put on palliative care with my condition retrograding by the day. I'll never forget those feelings of helplessness, but my parents, my parents were there for me and they inspired me to never give up. I'm alive today because of them. I'm alive because they connected me with life-saving care abroad and the medical staff's warm and proficient care not only saved me, but led me to find a purpose and an appreciation for internal medicine that's continued to resonate through my medical training. Essentially, I was a child who was never supposed to make it, but did. I'll never forget what it's like to be a patient. I'm grateful to be alive, and I live every day like it's my last. And that's why I started to do research at the age of 15, as a means to give back one day, so that I can, so that when I do become a licensed physician, I can have the same positive impact on the lives of my patients as the clinicians who save me, but also contribute to pioneering novel research innovations. Thank you. So that's a really inspiring story. So how is your situation right now? So do you still have the sensation of the impact or you're, you can say that you're completely cured from those horrible influence? I have to say that thankfully, knock on wood, I am hopefully cured. <laughs> we say that because we don't know. And I only say that because the dark cloud of Chernobyl has continued uh, to beat its head uh, around everyone who's a survivor. It has affected my family in the past and in some ways still continues to affect us to this day. And so I don't want to say that the, that, that uh, tragedy is over. But we do still feel the after effects in some way, shape or form, even to this day. Yeah. So I can uh, really relate to it uh, because I myself was uh, born in the area where the Chernobyl uh, struck. And I still remember the stories of my parents that uh, I was still a baby. I was in a stroller and they remember us uh, uh, going uh, outside and they suddenly see... Uh, in oily rain and nobody understood what, what, what's going on and they seen oil all over and of course uh, nobody informed anybody right so everything uh, it was kept secret and uh, i know that every many of the people who lived in this area passed away really uh, quickly or until now we we moved away they still kept living in this area and many of them uh, die prematurely so this uh, 
disaster is of course uh, is something that uh, many of the people are still uh, are maybe not conscious about but i think uh, uh, especially after the tv show that uh, came out you probably seen it that uh, the chernobyl uh, t- uh, mini series so that was uh, quite amazing and i think it really shocked uh, many people into understanding how government works and uh, how we should be more transparent and be more helpful to each other really to try uh, do our best uh, right and um uh, right now you're a researcher so you're doing a lot of uh, research in different directions so what uh, is your uh, main topic right now so most recently it has been covid so when the covid-19 pandemic struck the united states i really felt powerless and powerless because i had to watch as many of my neighbors family members and friends and colleagues we're on the front lines with many falling ill one by one almost like dominoes as one of the sole survivors from the after effects of chernobyl it seemed almost like deja vu all over again so after the pandemic struck i was recruited to join the global covid-19 task force to serve as a special advisor for immunology oncology and cellular therapeutics initially but in a very short time i was given a unique opportunity to become the director of the immunology division if i could lead an international team of mds phd's and md phd's to further investigate the mechanisms behind covid-19 in a very short time period now given the tall order i rapidly galvanized our respective expertise and within a few weeks we proposed one of the first cohesive mechanisms for sars-cov-2 that is still valid today our team was amongst the first in the world to explain the efficacy of a promising therapy against severe covid-19 and were proven correct when one of the companies within that space demonstrated promising clinical trial data and received US FDA fast track designation on December 1st, 2020, a week before the vaccines. Despite just being a medical student at that time, I'm extremely proud of what we collectively were able to accomplish. Now, in June of 2021, I'm honored to have presented the next chapter of this at the 2021 American Society of Clinical Oncology meeting. Um, I'm honored to present one of the first mechanisms in the literature showcasing the interplay between cancer and COVID-19 with support from clinical data and a promising therapeutic intervention that can offer respite to this vulnerable patient population. Are there implication long-term implications uh, of the uh, COVID-19 and uh, and cancer? We believe that based on the mechanism that we showed and based on the clinical data that we presented there is a synergy between the two where if you have a patient with cancer who is immunocompromised at baseline is at risk and then gets covid the resulting effects of the two uh, will create a worsening cytokine reaction that can lead to uh worse systemic injury and damage You've been uh, now part of the COVID uh, vaccine task force and you really had a lot on your hands right now and there there was a lot of stress with it. So uh, in your uh, opinion what are the main challenges that uh, we have in uh, um, in uh, medicine research right now? What obstacles do we face that uh, hinder us from uh, progressing much uh, quicker and uh, much more efficiently? When speaking about the development of novel drugs, um I would break it down into three main categories. There are probably more, but at least the three that I look at, which is funding, experience and regulation. Starting with funding initially, it's a large challenge especially for smaller pharmaceutical companies. Now, I'm not an investor, so uh, but from what I've heard, a large number of investors these days tend to be uh wary of investing in some ideas and they lean towards investing in projects with promising proof of concepts and strong preclinical and clinical data thus it makes it difficult to raise capital for smaller companies especially if they have very novel and innovative ideas in terms of experience it's important for individuals within a company to know their individual strengths and weaknesses for example while someone may have conceived the product at the bench going from a phd researcher to a ceo of a large pharmaceutical company can be a very big jump and that may not fit everyone 
Thus, it's important to know the limitations of one's knowledge and experience and put individuals with precise knowledge and experience as leaders at the helm to maximize organizational flow and overall success. The third is regulation. Now, there are companies with very novel ideas, like, for example, therapies to regulate the gut microbiome that are spearheading new fields and avenues. At the moment, there are no exact rules for what is needed to get such a product formal approval. Thus, this may scare away some investors due to the unpredictable nature of such a product, even if it demonstrates promising clinical efficacy. And so the question at the end of the day is, well, will it even get formal approval down the line? What you're saying, basically, so most of the challenges are not in finding novel medical entities, right, um, new molecules, but rather getting the right funding for them, getting to the next stage of development, and uh, uh, also, you know, the regulation with uh, new techniques. Exactly. Basically, you are saying we have a huge repertoire of uh, different molecules that you can test, but it's really difficult to pick the right one to progress with because many have so much potential. Sometimes, you know, um, tests fail, but it doesn't mean that the project needs to end. Sometimes you need to tweak something in, or, in order to fix or uh, go to another direction, but sometimes you fail because uh, of uh, a budget or because of some regulation, right? So this is uh, the main uh, point of what you're saying, that we have uh, the tools, but we need... Uh, you know, more trust and uh, more funding into research. Yes. Do you think that there are other ways which uh, can help us go around it? Are there other solutions rather than get more money by developing some new techniques for uh, research? For example, uh, AI, which is uh, quite uh, novel right now. Many are uh, research organizations trying to build some AI discovery tools that they can pinpoint the right molecules, which may be more promising. What are your thoughts about that? AI is a very promising platform that can overall speed up drug discovery. As for example, AI can be used to screen hundreds of promising drug candidates and narrow down the search. It can then be used to simulate drug interactions in a disease model, compare efficacy between different drug candidates, and even propose solutions for refining the therapy. It can ultimately speed up drug discovery, but at the end of the day, it will be the physical experiments that will dictate the success of a therapeutic agent, along with the data that we get from preclinical and clinical trials. So, for example, if we have uh, 10,000 molecules, which uh, usually from the statistic, uh, only one gets uh, to the market, right? Um, so it means that if uh, we use AI, we can uh, detect the one molecule much easier. So basically, instead of uh, going to the market with one from 10,000, we can go to the market with one from 100 each, for example. So it, it can really help us bring much more um, ready to use the products uh, to the market, right? So this is the idea. Yeah. Right. And uh, where are we uh, with uh, those solutions? How progressed are we? Where do we have to go to get there? Honestly, it's important to know that while AI is a very promising technology, it's still very young. And it's important not to overestimate its potential simply because what you may simulate in a virtual environment may not turn out exactly in, at the bench, in preclinical trials, and even in clinical trials. And ultimately, it will be the clinical data, the actual experiments that you do that will dictate the success of whatever compound you are developing. However, we can use AI as an effective screen. It can speed up drug development. It can automate some process and elements down the line, but I still feel that it will be the clinical data that really rules in or rules out a promising therapeutic. The other thing that it's important to consider is that there are limits to this technology where, yes, you may find this drug in an ideal setting in the virtual realm and it may show profound efficacy. But when you try it in patients, the human body is very complex. There's lots of confounders and variables that the virtual environment, at least today in this time, 
may not be able to simulate or anticipate. So it's possible to construct the most efficacious drug in the virtual realm, but when you bring it to the real world, so to speak, it may fail in any of the stages that I had spoken about. So we must have realistic expectations and be able to pivot if things don't work out as we had initially anticipated. If we are speaking about the future, so right now the technology is limited, as we said, because we still cannot trust it 100% or I don't know even if we can trust it 50%. I don't have the data because we still need to go to clinical trials and so on and test it on the bench. But from your perspective, let's say 10, 20, 30 years, where are we headed and what is the potential? AI is a very powerful tool that I feel is here to stay. I feel that it will, over time, make its way, as it already has, into most uh, development in terms of research and development within companies and even within the academic sector as well. It's a powerful tool to simulate disease processes, help with research tasks like we had spoken about previously to narrow down effective and promising drug candidates, help to refine a promising candidate or candidate, and possibly automate some parts of the development and testing process. However, at this time, clinical studies are the gold standard to truly show the efficacy of a therapy and demonstrate its possible side effects. Do you see that the role of the researcher changes over time? So, for example, uh, right now, so when I did my master's studies, uh, there is a lot of people and there is a lot of encouragement for researchers to go into bioinformatics. So every anyone who studies biotechnology will also learn programming and uh, to use different tools uh, to uh, do some uh, virtual DNA manipulation, so on and so on. So what is your perspective on the future scientists? Would it be more data analysts or it will st still be mostly hands-on with a pipette or uh, you know, working with uh, clinical trials and animals? Honestly, I feel that the two of them are becoming more and more intertwined. And so it's important to have experience and exposure to both. But equally important, I feel, is that so I began doing research at the age of 15. I have 16 years of research experience to this day, and I'm very blessed for the experience that I've had. And it's stemmed all the way from basic science to translational medicine to a clinical research and most recently clinical trial. But what I really found invaluable was actually, in addition to the research knowledge that I had, was the medical training because it allowed me to see problems from the lens of a clinician and then go back to the bench and think about how can I refine or develop um, an experiment or a novel therapy or a novel approach to rectify that problem in the clinic? And so I feel that it's very much important to have that a holistic understanding, maybe not so narrow, 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 but at least a global view of how all of these areas can intertwine and then you can help and pioneer novel therapies and novel developments. Uh, because if you look back in time, a lot of the innovative products that were done was by incorporating different fields and new fields in unique ways. And if you are able to do that, you can achieve a lot of success and carve a very unique niche for yourself. You mentioned a bit about personalization also in the medicine. So it's a completely different area from AI, it may be uh, connected, but it is another area of uh, medicine that uh, is evolving. It's uh, not uh, quite there. Maybe we can be there because uh, we know much more about genetics, about epigenetics, about the immunology, but uh, we are also talking about, uh, of course, the price. So can you give a short overview about what personalized medicine is and the uh, where, where is it now in terms of uh, uh, evolution? Personalized medicine is what I like to think is multifactorial, where therapies can be tailored to the patient's unique gene profile and or a patient's immune cells, for example, can be primed to attack disease. 
Regarding the latter, I was fortunate to have been trained by one of the fathers of CAR T-cell therapy. Now, CAR T-cell therapy is a therapy where you take a patient's T-cells, genetically engineered them with a target like CD19 for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, turn it essentially into a heat-seeking missile, then reinfuse it into the body so that it can target and destroy the cancer, largely sparing healthy cells. This therapy received FDA approval in 2017, and uh, the BMS CAR T-cell product that was approved in February of 2021 was actually made in our lab. I contributed the next generation of these therapies, where I made the gene targeting platform using Talons initially, and then CRISPR-Cas9 for CAR T-cells. Uh, studies showed that this therapy demonstrated greater efficacy with a reduced side effect profile in animal models. And then it was later acquired by a smaller pharmaceutical company uh, that received FDA approval last year to start clinical trials. And most recently was purchased by a larger pharmaceutical company that is incorporating this technology into its uh, into the next generation of its uh, immunotherapy products. Do you see that if many pharmaceutical companies will jump on the opportunity? Does it make sense for them? Or um, how do you imagine a pharmaceutical company that uh, does personalized medicine, right? So it's, it's probably a different, uh, uh, different approach because uh, usually when you have medicine, you produce batches, thousands uh, of uh, pills or dozens of vials. So how does a pharmaceutical company look like when it does personalized medicine? The one thing that's very important is taking cancer into example, uh, because that's where my background is in. It's a very heterogeneous disease. And especially when you look at solid tumors, where, for example, if you look at colon cancer, colon cancer from patient A to B to C to D can be totally different based on their unique gene profile. And so the therapy that works for patient A may not be as effective for patient B or for patient C or for patient D. And so it's important to adjust and adapt in some ways for several diseases that have such profound heterogeneity. But well, in doing so, and that is one of the problems initially that with CAR T-cell therapy is cost, access, and expertise. So some challenges, for example. So when you look at lower socioeconomic areas and rural areas, for example, there's limited access to these therapies. Now, there are some reasons for that and many reasons probably, but a few include cost, personnel, infrastructure. And a lot of the time, these individuals need to travel to larger academic institutions for their treatment. And many of these therapies are already expensive at baseline. For example, uh, I think the cheapest CAR T-cell therapy at the moment is $375,000 in the U.S. And you add on to that travel expenses, costs, and additional challenges. And these are things that you have to address in controlling the cost. Now, what, where the field is moving to is off-the-shelf therapies, where essentially it's personalized, but the product that you're delivering um, is still efficacious, but it can be given to any patient. So you don't have to take their individual T cells, for example, you can kind of take a different span of T cells that you can then reinfuse into that patient. And the benefit of that from a clinical realm, having managed some of these patients is sadly uh, the time at one point from you extracting those T cells to you reinfusing them back could take 20 days. And when you have a very advanced cancer, that patient may not be a candidate in 20 days and sadly, they may pass away. And sadly, I've had that happen. And so by you having these off-the-shelf therapies, theoretically, you can already have these therapies on standby, ready in your hospital, that if you have a patient that meets their criteria, you can give it to them on the spot. And so it's important to think outside the box, where it's still personalized, but personalized with a spin, so to speak, so that you can... In, you can improve um, access time for the patients while decreasing production costs. And hopefully by decreasing production costs, that will then carry down to improving affordability for patients. 
we can agree that it has a huge potential, right? So do you think that uh, those personalized medicine don't get the attention they deserve and the budget they deserve? Because as we mentioned, it's really costly. It means not many uh, angel investors or uh, uh, or venture capital- capitalists want to invest into something that may not uh, uh, go into mass production. So what are the biggest challenges in the, the development of uh, such re- treatments? So really, I feel the biggest challenge is um, having promising data because one may have a great concept in their mind, uh, but then when you do, and even they may show something in animal models, but not everything from animal models directly translates into humans. And so I feel like to really catch the eye of the people who are willing to invest in it will be demonstrating solid proof of concepts, promising and strong clinical data with a strong long and short term plan on how they hope to take this therapy to the next stage, expand it, and hopefully, you know, if they do get approval, Ex, uh, being able to deliver on the promise of getting it to the, the vast market as a whole. So we know that uh, personalized medicine works and we know it has a huge potential because the more we decipher how our DNA works and recently uh, there were a lot of breakthroughs with epigenetics, which is uh, another level which were not known to us uh, uh, maybe a decade ago and uh, maybe 20 years ago it was not that developed so people understand okay we can also do personalized medicine by met- methylation and uh, uh, of uh, of the genes and can it can also be personalized to some way so there is a lot of potential there so do you think it will at first be a luxury product and only the rich will be able to afford it because it there will be specific clinics where people have to come and then it's not just a drug that you give them it's probably a process where it involves a lot of uh, laboratory work personalized laboratory work so i know that there are some companies already incorporating epigenetics into the development of next generation of car t cells but that's a question that's very difficult to answer. And it's difficult to answer because it depends if the smaller company will be bought out by a larger pharmaceutical company, which already has the infrastructure to expand the therapy. And at that point, the game kind of changes because it's what that company, it's what the larger company says in terms of its rollout plan, its distribution policy, and things to that effect. Whereas if you have a smaller company, it will honestly be up to them. And a lot of it will also depend on competition, how quickly the competition catches up and ultimately results. Results, I feel, will be the biggest thing because if you have a cool product that maybe is a lot, expe- is, sorry, is very expensive, but contrarily, a different company comes out with a, product that is easier to make but demonstrates promising efficacy or equal efficacy to your more expensive product, I would think the market would shift more toward the cheaper product as long as the side effect profiles are equivalent and things to that effect, simply because um, everyone, uh, because you're thinking about global access. And global access, as I had stated earlier, is an issue at this point with CAR T-cell therapy, and a lot of it is also contingent on cost. And so we must address those parts, uh, streamline development processes and decrease costs. And that I feel can be a model for future and next generation of those therapies in terms of how can we make them more affordable. And also compensation models um, will also have to be adjusted, but that's kind of something uh, country dependent. with its regulatory bodies that will uh, dictate how the compensation is made, how much it will be. And those are discussions for the future when more of these therapies become available. So we seen that during the COVID situation, we had a challenge. It was a global issue and it required, you know, thinking outside the box, acting quickly. And uh, we seen that it's possible to bring several vaccines to the market really quickly we see that it's possible to develop new technologies new processes new d- treatments really quickly right so 
do you think that we can learn something from this uh, difficult time that will help us with other treatments in the future? So this pandemic has shown us the importance of academia and industry working together to address research questions in a very effective and timely fashion. As you had just stated, by the rapid development of vaccines and also monoclonal antibodies against COVID-19. Moving forward, I foresee greater synergy between the two. Additionally, I also see changes in regulation where criteria for certain therapies are better defined and addressed. Some red tape is removed so that these promising therapies can enter clinical trials quicker. And we see better communication between drug developers and regulatory agencies. I also see AI playing a bigger role in terms of streamlining the research process and development aspects. So I really hope that it will happen because we see that it's possible and it was amazing to see companies cooperate with each other and uh, helping each other with uh, the development of the drug and the distribution and so on. And I really hope it will uh, uh, get there also during uh, times of uh, not crisis, right? Uh, during uh, uh, happier times. And uh, in general, uh, what do you think is the next breakthrough in, uh, in the medicine? Do you think it will be in, in a cancer therapy? What I've seen is a lot of breakthroughs in many ways actually begin in the world of oncology, and then they are translated to other fields of medicine as a whole. Now, I see the use of precision medicine combined with AI taking a larger role and presence in daily practice for health with diagnostics and therapeutic interventions. Immunotherapies will play a larger role in cancer treatment and likely be moved to second, and hopefully first line for some cancers. I see cellular therapies like stem cells pervading various medical subspecialties to offer new forms of longer lasting relief. I foresee an increase in the use of DNA-based precision diagnostics for many cancers and targeted therapies based on particular mutations and unique gene profiles. I also foresee gene therapies playing a larger role in treating conditions like sickle cell anemia, beta thalassemia, and several congenital diseases. I also foresee the gut microbiome playing a larger role in how therapies are selected and more insight into its role in pathologies and therapeutic resistance. Great. So it sounds really promising and I hope that we will get there uh, very soon. So Jan Leifund, thank you very much for taking your time and uh, uh, coming to this interview and speaking about all those interesting, fascinating, important uh, topics. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to the Quality Talks podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star review. If you want to learn more about GMP, please visit us at www.qualistory.com. Stay compliant and see you at the next one.